This will be the first of three uh, meetings. Uh, we'll cover the regional actors and the global actors later on. And our intent is to build on these meetings. Noel is going to moderate this meeting. I'll moderate the second one on the regional actors. So Noel, you have the floor. Well, in summary, the first one is really about what's going on in Marib and the impact that is going to have on, on the various participants. Um, and we are asking um, two of the authors of the regional, uh, of, the, of the local dynamics chapters in the book to, to start this off, linking it where, where possible, where appropriate to their chapters. So I'm going to ask Nadwa and Luca to uh, start the discussion. Thank you. Houthis launched a major offensive a month ago, over a little over a month ago to take Marib. Um, and there is a there is a real threat that they would take the city. Um, Houthis have superior weapon capabilities um, and a lot of fighters. The local forces, Yemeni, gov Yemeni government forces and the tribes are on the defense. And the only thing that's stopping Houthis from taking Marib now is really the airstrikes. Um, the government forces and the, and the tribes don't have the weapons that would allow them to push the Houthis out um, too. So what would happen if Houthis take Marib? And let's remember that this is a city that before the war only hosted 50,000 people and they were almost all, they were local tribesmen. The city have grown into, um, it's grown into a, a, a big city um, with 3 million civilians, including 1.5 million IDPs, according to a humanitarian expert um, involved in Yemen that I talked to a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the prospects of Houthis taking Marib would have huge, massive uh, consequences uh, on the humanitarian situation um, and expect a major humanitarian disaster. Three million people might be displaced. The implication of Houthis taking Marib on the humanitarian situation would, would be probably unprecedented in Yemen. Um, on the other side as well, the Houthis, if they take Marib, they will capture Safer uh, oil company. And Marib is one of three governorates in the country that has oil, uh, but also Marib is a source of oil, Yemen gas as well. So with that, Houthis will have resources to fund their war. Um, <clears throat> however, we have to also be realistic. Houthis have, are pretty much overstretched. Um, they're in control of the north. Marib is going to be another story. They're not going to be able to control Marib easily. Uh, it will probably be a bit of a, you know, a, a bit of a big bite for them to swallow and they might choke on it. Um, I, one of the potential scenarios is for Marib to turn into a battleground. Um, Houthis might agree with some tribal leaders, but then they're very much resented in Marib that a lot of people will choose to fight them. Um, now Houthis have in the past quelled opposition and we all remember what happened in Hajur a couple of years ago where the tribes rebelled against the Houthis and they were they were harshly uh, uh, defeated by the Houthis. So we might also see that scenario. But one thing for sure is that Marib, which has been an icon of stability, security that attracted a lot of Yemenis, millions of Yemenis, is no longer going to be that. It will, it will be a destabilized um, region. Um, and Houthis might be able to eventually control it uh, using their maximum force. Um, and if they do that, they would likely um, expand into Shabwa and Hadramaut um, and potentially to the rest of Yemen. Um, now there is a question about what the government of Yemen position will be. It will be weaker in the negotiation table. I mean, the government is, is weak uh, as it is now, but it will be even weaker. Um, and I don't know what UN negotiations will mean if Houthis take Marib. Uh, the government is, as I said, in the South, it's at the mercy of the SDC. It was kicked out um, from Aden a couple of years ago, and it came back after 
more than almost two year negotiation led by the Saudis and pressure on the STC by the Saudis. So it has a shaky position in, in Aden. The STC, the Southern Transitional Council, um, already saying that they will negotiate with the Houthis if the Houthis take Marib. So I think also deeply inside the STC, to some extent, want the Houthis to take Marib because in their mind, it will help weaken Hadi and Islah. Um, and it will strengthen their position to push for secession. Um, but I honestly think again that there will be no peaceful scenario out of Marib Ball. That would be a, a, a game changer in Yemen war, but a game changer in the worst direction, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a much worse direction than the one we already, uh, we're, we're already in now. Um, Houthis will not stop their attempt to expand beyond Marib and uh, to the south. Um, and a lot of locals, in Marib, but beyond Marib as well, might pick up arm. Most likely, will pick up pick up arm and and fight uh, against the Houthis, and that will basically destabilize a lot of regions in Yemen uh, that are relatively stable right now. So the implications on not only peace in Yemen and the potential to like end the war, but also the stability of 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 uh, you know of, of the country of um, eighty percent of the country that's uh, now an, outside the Houthi control. So Luca, do you want to? To add to that, please. Uh, yes, perhaps I can elaborate on some of the points raised by Nadwa. Uh, so perhaps the, the first point is that the Marib conflict was not sudden and not, ex not unexpected. It was long prepared by the Houthis who started advancing in al Baida in the April of last year, and then they moved uh, to the south of Marib Governorate. And during the summer and the fall of 2020, they advanced also in Al Jaw Governorate. So they basically surrounded Marib from three different directions. And what's interesting is that basically they put on hold this military campaign between the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. And somehow this might raise the question of why they put on hold this campaign and why they reignited it at the beginning of February. I think that. The, there is a clear connection, as Nadwa already highlighted, uh, with the US presidential, presidential elections. And uh, somehow this brings me to the first uh, uh, comparison with what we have written in our book. In fact, we can try to compare what happened back in 2016 when there were the previous US presidential elections with what is happening right now in Yemen. And we can observe that US presidential elections, they always trigger a double movement. In a sense, the outgoing administration tries to strengthen their efforts to leave their footprint on the Yemeni file. And back then you will remember that John Kerry tried to push forward a peace proposal that uh, mm, there was a, mm, accepted by the Houthis to a certain degree, but probably not by the internationally recognized government. And after the election of the new Trump administration, a new window of opportunities developed. And during that period, for instance, Saleh thought that the connections of Trump and the Trump administration with Saudi Arabia could somehow push the Saudis to stop their advance in their, their military campaign in Yemen. And at the same time, the Houthis tried to establish new relationships with Russia and China. So the big question is, how is the new Biden administration influencing the, the situation on the ground in Yemen? And I see a connection between the Houthi advance in Marib right now uh, and the fact that we have a new uh, US administration that is trying to reopen a channel of communication with uh, Iran around the JCPOA. Um, the Houthis very often talk in a military language, and this could be a signal to the US and to Saudi Arabia. So this could be a first connection and a theme to debate. A second point is the role of ceasefires and um, back-channel talks with uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so the first point here is that um, the back-channel talk between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia cannot be taken for granted, and this is clearly demonstrated in our book. Uh, back in 2015, the Houthis were not capable of, of establishing a line of communication with the Saudis, and also Saleh was cut off those uh, communications with the KSA. 
um, this line of communication was somehow reestablished in 2016 and it led to a ceasefire and then to the Kuwait talks. Something um, similar uh, happened in 2017 when Saleh decided to turn the page and he started talking with the Saudis in the summer of 2017. So these back channel talks always had huge uh, consequences for the situation uh, in Yemen. And the last example uh, is from 2019 when the Houthis declared a unilater unilateral ceasefire. And that was very effective because uh, the number of airstrikes and shellings um, decreased uh, until uh, the beginning of 2020. So the point here is that the ceasefires and the back channel talks are very often connected and that these back channel talks uh, are very effective in, uh, in somehow uh, pushing the Houthis to accept a ceasefire or to change their uh, behavior uh, on the ground. And it's also interesting that apparently uh, Saudi Arabia did not receive uh, positively the, the, the news that of the designation of the Houthis as an FTO because this could have endangered the back channel talk with them. So it would be interesting to understand how this whole situation will develop also considering that, for instance, Mohammed Ali Al Houthi recently declared that they aim uh, to enter negotiations only with the real decision makers who are, in their opinion, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and the United States. The last point, perhaps, is uh, uh, about uh, Houthi ideology with regard to the Marib battle. Um, as we clearly demonstrate in the book, the Houthis emerged uh, as a sort of anti-system movement. Um, they had a clear um, anti-imperialist view, but they gained popularity back in uh, 2014 uh, by opposing the existing regime. Well, now the Houthis are in power, so it's, it's different for them. They are accountable for providing or not providing services for how they are conducting the war and for a number of other uh, issues. And basically their ideology has somehow shifted uh, because on the internal side, they are trying to enforce a stricter Islamic moral framework. But on the external side, they are stressing the fact that they are fighting against the aggression. And, uh, um, and a not a majority of people, but some people at least in the North in Houthi controlled territories are supporting the Houthis uh, because they are opposing the so-called Saudi uh, aggression. So the, the campaign in Marib could also be understood as an attempt uh, for the Houthis to gain popularity. Should they fail in Marib, this would have, have enormous consequences for their popularity on their internal front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask Jack at this stage to, 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 to comment? Um, I think you do not. You've seen the book, I think. I don't know whether you've actually had time to read it. But. <laughs> uh, I, I read as much as I could. Um, I haven't had the chance to go through all of it, but um, very much enjoyed doing so. Um, I have to say, I do feel slightly an imposter uh, in this group, as I think everyone else here is uh, justifiably described as an expert on Yemen, and I can at best be described as an observer. Um, but what I can potentially contribute some expertise on is, is the military situation and how you might look at this situation in military terms. Um, because I think there is a disconnect between the military conversation and the conversation that happens between those who are experts on the politics in Yemen, um, which can be unhelpful when we're looking at policy options outside of Yemen. Um, so I think the thing I want to really get across is the why these tactical engagements are so often going in the Houthis' favor. Because when you look at the force densities and numbers, that, that isn't necessarily obvious from the outset. Um, and I think that the thing to flag is that initially in the conflict, the Houthis were operating with a um, essentially platoon sized, largely family based uh, units that had fought together historically, had a certain amount of experience, often knew the terrain that they were operating in um, and were essentially competent light infantry combatants. Um, who were able to cooperate in those small groups. And that cooperation meant that on the battlefield, they were often able to outmaneuver and defeat um, Yemeni government forces who were less coordinated and less tactically proficient, um, even when weaponry was perhaps quite comparable. But what we've seen in the last, probably through, over the last three years, 
is a very substantial shift in Houthi tactics. Um, and that is reflective of a couple of things. Firstly, as they got bogged down in uh, offensive operations in more complex terrain that they were less familiar with, they started taking casualties. Secondly, as they took over population areas and were able to mobilize large numbers of young fighters um, who didn't share those same connections or experience or tactical competence, um, they suddenly had a command and control issue. Um, and thirdly, they were receiving new weaponry and equipment from the Iranians, which has shifted how they fought. And so the way that the Houthis have been fighting over the last couple of years has largely consisted of using um, a large number of poorly coordinated light infantry uh, volunteers, recruits, impressed troops um, to flood the battle space, cause defensive positions to reveal their positions by, by having to suppress and engage those fighters. Um, and then actually having the trained Houthi fighters equipped with uh, thermal optic, uh, essentially anti-material rifles um, and other more sophisticated weaponry stood back who are then able to knock out those defensive positions as they reveal themselves. Um, the result being that the core Houthi fighters are not exposing themselves to very much risk. Um, and while they do take casualties, they don't take casualties on the whole among the part of their force that is most um, important in terms of their ability to inflict damage on the enemy. Um, and once they take territory, we've seen them persistently then essentially mine uh, the surrounding area in order to impose a very, very high cost or force the adversary to uh, concentrate in a uh, kind of with a level of sophistication that most of the Yemeni military units are not able to achieve in order to retake that ground without suffering unacceptable attrition. And that has meant that they've been able to hold areas with relatively small numbers of personnel. Um, a couple of other points that I think are particularly relevant here. Firstly, they have internal lines of communication and therefore have been able to move troops around the territory that they control to concentrate against areas that they want to apply pressure against. Um, and conversely, the Yemeni government, while it does have forces obviously surrounding those Houthi positions, has been insufficient in its coordination to be able to attack from multiple fronts. That's partly a result of diplomatic pressure, but it's also um, a result of a lack of cooperation between those units, which means that the Houthis are able to concentrate whereas uh, the Yemeni government has not been able to maneuver its forces to, to kind of oppose those attacks. Um, and I think when we look at that tactical competence at the lower level, um, Nadwa commented on the fact that, you know, many tribal fighters will arm themselves to protect the area that is being attacked. But um, we would usually look at requiring a three to one advantage to retake ground in numbers. That doesn't really play out nicely when you're looking or neatly when you're looking at uh, irregular forces. And so we have a situation in which um, the Houthis are persistently able to effectively take ground, uh, hold it, and the Yemeni government is struggling to apply pressure against them around that large frontage um, around the territory. And where I think this becomes particularly significant is that because of the highly localized nature of the conflict, the inability of the Yemeni government to threaten Houthi territory means that the risk of any uh, sheikh or leader within the areas under Houthi control, um, switching sides or you know, altering their allegiance or position is very, very risky because the, the prospect of the Yemeni military being able to support them in any way or allocate resources to support them is minimal, whereas the Houthis have been able to reposition their forces um, and as Nadwa explained and, and mentioned previously, conduct offensive operations against tribal groups that that have risen against them. Um, and so for that reason, I think that the Houthis are in a very strong position. They feel fairly stable. And even if they are taking casualties, um, there are, there's perceived failure of governance. The risk of rising up against them um, without that happening over a large area and in a coordinated manner is simply too great. And so from a military point of view, um, I think the Houthis may fail to take Marib because the airstrikes are inflicting very heavy casualties and, and suppressing their advance, um, but are nonetheless uh, in a much more favorable position and one in which they are developing new capabilities uh, with Iranian support that allow them to conduct persistent strikes uh, in depth against a lot of the territories that are stable. Um, and I think that that poses a very difficult challenge for, for the negotiating teams because for foreign actors, you know, backing the Yemeni government in that context is difficult, given that there is 
on the one hand, massive political pressure not to do anything hostile to the Houthis, and at the same time, a massive asymmetry on the battlefield, or rather distributed incremental asymmetry on the battlefield that favours the Houthis almost across all fronts. Um, so with that, I will, I will hand back to those who are far better qualified to comment. No, thank you. It's very interesting. I'm so, uh, on the call, I think one or two other people were with the governor of Marib the other day. He said that the, um, the Yemeni army casualties uh, in the year of this Marib offensive were between 17 and 18,000 people killed, which I thought was uh, you know, more than I thought. And I assume the Houthis are taking similar losses. But although what you suggest, perhaps they aren't. Anyway, sorry. Uh, no, I, no, could I say something please, at this point please. that, that yeah. I think is important as we we, and it's a good discussion. I think we need to continue this and maybe go over the time that we set for it. But I want to point out that, you know, less than three years ago, the situation at Marib was the opposite, right? And this was at the time that there was an offensive at Al Hudeda, right? The Stockholm Agreement removed the pressure on Ansar Allah at um, Al Hudeda. And at that time, government forces um, in the east in Marib had actually advanced up into the lands that Houthi control today. So certainly international observers need to understand that the way that pressure that was put at Al Hudeda when Ansar Allah was under threat is the reason why you have the threat to the government at Marib today. Very briefly on the on the point about you know how that fighting played out, the coordinating role, the critical coordinating role between those forces at that time, and the reason why the Yemeni military was able to coordinate its activities was largely UAE enablement. And exactly. so the stepping back of the UAE pulled back a lot of the embedded units that were had radios, knew how to use them, and were providing that coordination function. Right, but at that time there was international pressure on the UAE, right? There was a lot of objection to what the UAE was doing. I'm just simply saying that that's the reality on the ground. A lot of people have this kind of naive view about what's happening in Yemen, that it really is all about uh, President Hadi and his GCC backers that are the source of the problem. And I think people need to understand that Ansar Allah and its forces in Sana'a are also, you know, an equal share in, in the problem in Yemen. I want to build on what you said, uh, Stephen. Uh, the problem is that the UN process have contributed to this, not only by preventing the government forces from taking, from taking Hodeida, which, you know, what happened was then that the Saudis and the government stopped, the Emiratis stopped taking Hodeida, but Houthis exploited that ceasefire and they expanded east. They took a huge, uh, you know, territory, including Al Jauf, uh, and now they're, they're threatening Marib. But what happened also after that, last year, after Houthis took Al Jauf, a month later, the government forces launched a, a counteroffensive, and they pushed the Houthis back, and Houthi forces were, were, were collapsing. Um, uh, it was happening very quickly. And what happened then was Martin Griffith insisted on a ceasefire when government forces were pushing the Houthis out of the areas that they just took from the government. Um, and because of his pressure, the Saudis stopped their strikes and the government, uh, you know, stopped uh, the offensive, which again played into the hands of the Houthis. The point is, I'm trying to make is that the, the UN process is part of the problem. It's trying to, 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 uh, to uh, establish a ceasefire and that's what it should do, but then it's, it, it, it doesn't factor all these other things. Um, it, it, it's disconnected from the reality on the ground, the military reality on the ground, and the fact that the Houthis are just not really interested in a, in a ceasefire. So a, a couple of, of quick comments. It, it's, of course, completely correct, in my view, to compare what happened in Hodeida in 2018 with what's happening in the Ram Marib right now um, for three main reasons. First, it is really disappointing the level of international attention that is being directed towards Marv at this moment in, in time. Um, I'm not trying to claim um, any great victory here, but, but at ICG, we've made ourselves quite unpopular in Sanaa by really pushing this point with people. And part of the challenge um, with Marv today at the international level, as with, I have to say, the Red Sea Coast and her data in 2018, is the quote unquote international community, which we know isn't a, a real thing, only really responds when absolute disaster is completely imminent. So 
So from around sort of May, June 2018, um, annoying people like me were saying, hey, if, if Hadeda gets taken out of commission for weeks or months, that has a really bad effect on the supply chain in Yemen. But it's really only when the, um, whatever we want to call them, the, the joint resistance forces as they are now, um, punch through um, the, the Sana Hadeda road and semi-encircle the city that people suddenly realize this might be a problem, partly because humanitarians are jumping up and, and down. And I have a feeling that on Marib we're going to have a very similar experience. The facts are known. The battle has been, as, as Jack described, stop-start. Um, and as Luca said, has been ongoing for um, over a year now. It's a concerted, highly complex campaign that the Houthis are leading, which is again comparable to what happened in 2018, where for the first time we saw an external actor really coordinate Yemeni forces in a way that allowed them to, to gain ground, in this case with, of course, some um, air support. And what I suspect is going to happen in the coming weeks and months is as the cost of um, human costs of a Marib battle, and, and by a Marib battle, I mean a battle for Marib City and the south of facilities nearby, it becomes clearer and clearer. And I concur with, with Jack's assessment, which is in line with what I hear from the US and, and the Brits and, and others, which is left sort of as is. Um, this is going to encroach on Marib City, but won't necessarily mean that the, the city falls straighter away. And that's again similar to, to Hadeda. Um, and where I want to sort of provide something of a counterfactual really quickly, um, I know there are people on this call who will disagree with me, is that we, we spent a lot of time in 2018 looking at sort of likely scenarios for a battle for Hodeida, Port and, and City. And we ended up in this place where we'd speak to senior American military people and they'd say, hey, look, if the US did this, we'd find it really hard. It would take us a long time. A lot of stuff would get destroyed and a lot of people would be killed. Um, and they point to places like Fallujah, um, where you've got sort of supposedly one of the, the most professional fighting forces in the world, encroaching on a, an urban territory of a similar size. And Jack can, I'm sure, speak the ins and outs and tell me I'm speaking nonsense on, on this if he so wishes. And then when we looked at the actual sort of highly skilled fighting force on, on the ground, with the Joint Resistance Forces, people love to talk about 20, 30, 40,000 people. But the tip of the spear was really sort of two or three groups within Amalika, um, really hardline experienced Salafi fighters, really you know, nice guys who I spent some time with at the, the um, end of 2018. Um, but they were actually in fairly limited numbers. The guys that you want to have going in, doing what uh, Jack describes the Houthis as doing, taking space, holding it, securing, moving it up, moving on. And these guys, 100%, were not sort of trained in um, international humanitarian law, as, as Nabma knows. And that's not to say the Houthis are, we don't need to get into moral relativism. So the, the idea in 2018 that the Houthis, and I'll, I'll wrap up really quickly, and I'm speaking at too much length, the yes. idea that, that her data would have fallen within sort of, you know, one, two days or, or several yes weeks, I think, was somewhat erroneous. And I think the same is true of, of Marib right now. But that actually just increases the humanitarian cost overall and means that people will intervene. So I see a very similar set of scenarios, including the conversations, which are very one zero that are going on around Marib. Some international saying, well, it hasn't fallen, therefore it won't fall. Or the Houthis get to the gates of the city and people will still not have paid enough uh, attention. It's a very familiar scenario that the world over. I just want to throw that comparison in. Do any of the other uh, any other people like to come in before we move on to the next question? Uh, Manuel. No, if I might, just uh, a quick final point to perhaps to wrap up. Uh, I think it's also important to consider the uh, uh, the implications of the um, uh, of the Houthi offensive. Uh, on other on other uh, fronts in the conflict, and I think a recent example is uh, is ties where yeah. oil uh, or the, at least the anti coalition uh, uh, fighting the Houthis um, ha have made considerable ground over the last uh, over the last few weeks, and it seems almost there is a withdrawal 
uh, in certain areas around tires of, of, uh, of Houthi forces. And thus, uh, this is something I wanted to flag because as we were developments in, in uh, one front are usually linked to, to military developments in another front. Yes, I think, yeah, yeah. I'm going to jump in really quickly there. Um, it's, a, it's a really important point. But, I mean, don't get me wrong, the Houthis lie all the time, but one of the things I'm hearing out of Sonar is what's happened in tires in, in recent days, maybe less about sort of a loss of territory and more of a, a strategy on the Houthis' part to bring the Red Sea Coast forces and Tariq Sara into direct contact with Isla, um, Isla, quote unquote, the, the Tazi forces on the other side. And we're already seeing a lot of ripples between those those groups online. I mean, it's a very good conversation, I thought. So.